All right, good morning, friends. Welcome back to your 8 a.m. class. Maybe not your favorite class. <laughs> uh, right, so we'll continue our discussion with Cure Kinetics today. Uh, just make a note that I have created a Cure Kinetics homework. I thought I posted it to Blackboard, but apparently Rachel says that it's not on Blackboard, so I'll check after this lecture and make sure that it's up there. All right, after today, you should be able to tackle it. Um, it's four problems, but two of the problems are really just like make a graph and pull off a number. OK, so um, it should be pretty straightforward homework. OK, uh, the homeworks going forward should be a lot more simplistic. All right, so that's, you know, a good thing for you guys. OK, so that's that. Let's move with uh, continuing our discussion. So I want to put you on the white pad for a minute, and then I'm going to show you some uh, stuff online about epoxy resins. All right, so last time we were talking about cure kinetics of epoxies. Specifically of epoxy plus amine. Creating for yourself a solid. And we showed what is the structure of an epoxy, what is the structure of an amine, um, these liquid components that will react with each other to create this solid. All right. So I wanted to just take one second quickly and show you what this looks like if you actually wanted to like go and buy some of this stuff, what you might want to like look for online and uh, some of this just general information. So I'm going to flip you guys over quickly to uh, a website that has a lot of this uh, epoxy stuff and they generally have good data sheets and all that sort of information. And a lot of these resins and stuff I have used personally in the past. All right. So here you should be able to see my screen. This is a, a website for a distributor of epoxy resins and curing agents, as well as some other materials called Miller Stevenson. So you see Miller Stevenson up here in the upper left. Right now I'm in a category of their website that describes the epoxy resin systems. So you see that kind of up in the upper left hand corner here. And here are the sort of products that they offer related to epoxy resins. And there are a lot of things here, but really what we care about is this uh, epoxy resin on the right hand side here. So Epon is their trade name for their epoxy. So it's kind of on the right hand side here. And then the curing agents and Epicure is their trade name for their curing agents. So the Epon Epicure Part A, Part B epoxy curing systems. All right. So let's click on these epoxy resin systems first. And there are a lot of different um, things we can click on for various industries uh, in this particular image, but we want unmodified liquid epoxy resins because that's kind of what our discussion has been at this point, the most basic fundamental epoxies that we could get. All right. So they all come in liquid form. So you'll see here kind of examples of what it would look like on their website if you wanted to buy them. You see sort of this jug of material, it looks like a gallon of milk. Don't want to be drinking that, let me tell you. Uh, that is the liquid epoxy that's in this particular barrel, and they have these various trade names. This is number 830, this is Epon 825, so on and so forth. Uh, you'll see here, this Epon 828 is their best seller by far. I just know this because I've worked with it in the past. And you'll see here, it's an undiluted, clear, difunctional bisphenol A. All right, so we talked about Dejiba in last class, diglycidal ether bisphenol A. So this is their undiluted, bisphenol A resin. It is their pure Dejiba epoxy resin uh, chemistry. So we can click on this. There's some additional information that comes up here for making fiber reinforced pipes, tooling, construction, so on and so forth. It gives you a little bit of general information. And then there are data sheets available. So I want to look at the data sheet quick. And what you'll see in the data sheet is additional information uh talking about maybe kind of like selling their product a little bit with this product description so on and so forth but again a difunctional meaning i have two epoxides on either end of the molecule bisphenol a uh liquid resin a couple of additional information things that you see here is weight per epoxide so remember we talked about um how many epoxide molecules there are inside of my resin so how much weight is there for an equivalent mole of that particular epoxide all right, so grams per equivalent mole of epoxide. The viscosity of this guy at 25C is 110 poise, so that's pretty thick. That's about like, that's thicker than most honeys, okay? So that's pretty like viscous uh, liquid, 
right? So additional information about this particular guy, so on and so forth, all right? And it gives additional information on what it's used for um, and some of the various curing agents that you might want to use to cure this, all right? So you see these Epicure lines. What is the mix ratio here? Recommended range parts per 100. So 12 parts of this particular curing agent per 100 of the resin, okay? Per 100 resin. It gives you a the cure schedule, so on and so forth. All right, so this is a data sheet that suggests what, you know, curing agents you might want to use for this particular uh, resin, so on and so forth. But if you know the equivalent epoxide uh, per weight of the system, then you can just do your chemistry balance of like, okay, I've got this many epoxides and it weighs this much, and my curing agent can handle this many epoxides and weighs this much. I know I need a mix ratio of this and this and this, okay? So that's kind of how you would arrive at a, a cure ratio. So this is like a data sheet for that uh, bisphenol A uh, liquid epoxy. Now, I just want to take another trip down this product line and look at the curing agents a little bit as well. So we just clicked on the epoxy resins and looked at that bisphenol A resin. Let's just take a trip down this curing agent, okay? So these epoxy resins are like the part A, the liquid epoxies, and the part B here is the amines. These will be the things that react with the epoxies, okay? So these Epicure curing agents, and there are a variety of them. Um, I don't know, let's just click on any one of these. This has the most, so I guess we'll just click on this, this 3200 series. And again, you'll see a variety of different curing agents in liquid form available. It comes in kind of like these dangerous paint can looking things because that's kind of a dangerous chemical. Okay, so we can kind of like scroll our way down here and maybe click on one of these random guys. All right, you can sort of see it in liquid form here. Uh, and see here, this curing agent is a moderately reactive, low viscosity aliphatic amine. All right, so it's an amine used to cure this particular epoxy. All right can look at the data sheet here if you want, uh, but it should have something like telling us what mix ratio is required, what the viscosity is at room temperature. Okay, so this is 40 centipoise at room temperature. So this is like very, very non-viscous, all right? It's almost like water, right? Which is one centipoise at room temperature, right? So this is like very liquidy. So you're adding this like water type liquid amine to the very viscous uh, part A epoxy. So some additional information, additional information, but down here you'll start to see things like, okay, how many parts per parts do I need per weight um, of this 828, which is again the part A component, do I need of my Epicure 3274? So if I have 100 of my 828, I need 40 of the 3274, so on and so forth, okay? There are some additional modifiers here that you could include for like lowering viscosity or changing mechanical components properties or changing thermal properties, um, which I didn't really have time to talk about, these accelerators, catalysts, inhibitors, so on and so forth that you could add and sort of they give information on how you can mix those things together uh, in this data sheet, but that's the general idea. So I wanted to give some like practical information here in my lectures, not just math, 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 math over and over and over. Um, maybe some practical information here about what you might be looking for if you actually wanted to buy like a liquid epoxy and a liquid amine and some what these data sheets might sort of uh, generally look like. Okay. All right. Back to reality. Oops, there goes gravity. So last time we talked about the cure kinetics of an epoxy amine creating in a solid. And this reaction here, we generally know to be exothermic. For those of you that remember chemistry class and what that means, well, that means that it gives off heat. Okay. This is actually kind of a nice thing about these reactions that they give off heat because if we have scientific instruments that can track the amount of heat that these things are giving off, we can monitor how far the reaction has proceeded. Okay, So it's not going to react all together at the same time and give off you know, a bajillion heat. Okay, It's going to react slowly over some period of time to give off the total heat over some amount of time. Okay, So I will sort of make this explicit. All right, So it releases heat over time. All right, and we can track that using a scientific device known as a calorimeter.
I wanted to have a little bit of extra time to discuss calorimeters because they're actually kind of cool scientific devices. Uh, specifically, what the big boys use is what's called a differential scanning calorimeter. Um, but I just didn't really have time to get into it. Uh, it's too bad because they're actually really kind of cool pieces of scientific equipment. All right. Now, what might the heat flow over time look like for a reaction that we're going to do? Well, um, it might look like something like this. So here might be an example. And on the x-axis here, we're going to have time, right? On the y-axis, we're going to have uh, heat flow in watts, right? So this will be heat flow in units of watts, which, remember, is joules per second. All right, so same difference. Now, the way that this is going to go and typically how this would work is you take part A, you take part B, you mix them together in some way, you know, some tin or some cup or whatever. You mix them together, you mix them together, and that cup is going to get hot. Now, it's not immediately all going to react. There's going to be some ramp up. Then there's probably going to be some peak in the amount of heat that is generated, right? So the rate of heat generation. And then it's going to taper off over time as all of the remaining molecules sort of find each other and react together. So generally, this looks something like you're going to have some ramp up and there's going to be some peak and it's going to taper out over time, right? That's generally what your uh, heat of reaction is going to look like. We will typically label this function as W. T. This is the heat flow of the reaction as a function of time. Okay. Now, if we're able to track that and understand what that looks like and see what that is, then we do have the potential to understand all of the heat that this reaction could possibly give off if we were to mix these two particular things. Okay. So if we wanted, let's say, the total heat of reaction, this is given in joules per second. So if we integrated this curve up to a certain time, we could determine how much heat was released by that reaction over some time. Okay, so total heat released. By reaction. Is the integral of this curve over all time. So that would be, let's call it the variable Q and we'll say Q total is the integral from whenever you started this reaction, so time zero, to time infinity, right? Because we're looking at the total heat released by this particular reaction, the integral of this heat flow curve integrated over time, right? So if I'm looking at the total heat, that is the integral of this particular curve, so it's all the area under this particular curve, right? So all this area under the curve is Q total. This will be measured in usually in joules. All right, I'm a scientist, so I work in standard units, unlike us crazy Americans that tend to like English units. If you want to do heat flow and heat transfer in English units, you're crazy. Okay, let's talk about BTUs and horsepower. No thanks. How about joules? Okay, that's what I want. Uh, right, so the total heat of reaction is the total area under that curve for that particular chemical reaction, all right? Now, we may be interested in tracking the amount of heat that the reaction has released up to some particular time. And so it would be useful for us if we could track over time what that heat is. And so we can say then that the heat released by the reaction at any particular time So the heat released at time t is just the integral of this particular curve up to time t. So that would be q now as a function of time, not the total amount, but as a function of time. Here now integrating not from zero to infinity, but to some time of interest to us, our heat flow curve dt. So what I mean by that is if I have some arbitrary time, I'll give you a second to copy this down. If I have some arbitrary time that I'm interested in, let's say that here is some time that I care about, 
Well, the amount of heat released by the reaction at that particular time is just the integral up to that particular time. So that might be this area here, where this is the heat released at any particular time t. And as time progresses, we'll have more and more heat released according to what is this function w of t. All right, so why is this particularly useful? Well, it's useful because if we have, if we're tracking the amount of heat that has been released by a particular reaction, and that amount of heat that is released is equal to the total amount of the reaction, then our reaction's done. We're 100% cured. All right, so looking at how much heat has been released at any particular time compared to the total amount will give you a understanding of how much of that reaction has proceeded or what's called the degree of cure, all right? Allows us to quantify a degree of cure. And this is an important concept, a degree of cure. When you're talking about composite manufacturing, you will hear this term over and over and over. How long do I need to get it to this degree of cure? How much time, how much temperature is required to get 99% degree of cure? So on and so forth. If you do composite manufacturing, you hear this term all the time. All right. So it allows us to quantify a degree of cure, which simply is we define with the variable alpha. So alpha, which is a function of time is equal to the heat of the reaction that has been released at any particular time. So that is QT normalized by the amount that the reaction could potentially release. So that is the total amount that we had maybe previously measured in the laboratory. Most of these Q totals are known. Basically, they're known for every material. Known for most epoxy reactions. And if you don't know it, you can measure it using a calorimeter. Right? So the point is that your degree of cure is simply the amount of heat that your object has released at any time t normalized by the total amount that the exothermic reaction could potentially release. All right? Now, this value is obviously going to range between 0 and 1. Okay, 0 would be not cured at all, one would be 100% cured. Or what you'll see typically is 0% to 100%. Graphically, it's kind of like shown both ways, depending on kind of what the author likes, right? Let's look at an example of what this degree of cure evolution might look like as a function of time for uh, a certain resin system. So here's an example for epoxy plus not an amine reaction, but here is a vinyl ester reaction. Um, ready? Uh, magical. All right, I can move this over here. A couple of things I want to note about this particular graph. These temperatures here are the curing temperatures that were used for this particular reaction. Okay, so these are curing temps. Right, so 65, 60 we're holding constant the reaction at that particular temperature, right? What you'll notice is that obviously, as my temperature is increasing, my rate is increasing, right? So I get to a higher degree of cure more quickly if I cure this particular system at a higher temperature. Well, duh, okay, that's pretty obvious. Uh, we know that chemicals, Temperature is basically a measurement of how much molecular interaction there is in a particular liquid or solid, okay? So if I raise the temperature, that means my molecules are more active. That means they're going to react more quickly. That's like the freaking definition of temperature, okay? So, all right, that makes sense. And we'll also see here that 
there is another phenomenon that's sort of interesting that occurs. And you'll notice that like at low temperatures, we plateau at alpha less than 100%. Meaning that if I don't have a sufficient curing temperature that I could potentially not reach full cure. So here it looks like this 35 degrees C. If I'm curing at 35 degrees C, it looks like it's plateauing here at a value of like, I don't know, not even 30% cured, maybe like 30% cured. All right, so remember this degree of cure here, this is my variable alpha. So if I don't have enough temperature for this particular reaction, if I'm not putting my composite in an oven, if I'm not pressing the go button, uh, to give it enough temperature to do what it needs to do, it's never going to reach that cure. The molecules are not active enough to react with each other. Okay. This is kind of the basis for how prepreg works. All right. If you put a part A and a part B, you mix it together and you put it on ice, the degree of cure is flat. It plateaus at basically like zero. It is waiting for you to provide temperature to go through the reaction. That's the basis for how prepreg works. There's this plateau and uh, doesn't go anywhere. Okay, so this is basis for how prepreg works. Right. So it will plateau at like a degree of cure of zero or very near zero. All right. So this also means that I need sufficient temperature to reach alpha equals one, which is full cure. It looks like these guys here are maybe not quite done. Maybe they're gonna come up and plateau at 80%. Maybe this guy is going to plateau at 75%, something like that. Hard to say. Okay, it looks like those guys, even though you're delivering 50, 60, 65 C, it's still not enough to get it up to this 100% cure that you need. So even these curing temperatures are probably insufficient for fully curing this particular resin based on kind of the trajectory of those particular lines. Right? Okay, so... We've seen what this data actually looks like. We know what the shape of the exothermic reaction curve kind of looks like. It would be nice if we had the ability to model this reaction. So the question then is, can we mathematically model uh, the function alpha, right? Which is the degree of cure. Can we come up with some model that tells us, all right, if I provide this temperature, what is my degree of cure alpha as a function of time? All right. Well, yes, we can do this. And people have done this in the past. The general model is something like, we want to know what the rate of change of the degree of cure is. So that is, we want alpha dot as a function of t, which remember when we put the dot over something in like dynamics, this is d alpha t dt. This is the change in the degree of cure as a function of time, right? Now, how would we expect this to change over time? If I'm looking at this particular graph here, I want to know what is the rate of change that is the derivative of these particular lines as a function of time. How fast am I achieving additional cure given the previous history? All right. So what are the, what are the things that this is going to depend on? So it will depend on obviously time, obviously temperature. And we have to think about this chemically for a second. 
When I first mix part A and part B, every single epoxide in amine is available for reaction. Okay? That means that I can react with anybody around me as long as everybody around me is the right type of reactant. Okay? So if I'm an epoxide moiety, I'm looking at all these amines around me, they're all available for reaction. Okay? As I proceed with my chemical reaction, many of those molecules will end up being used up, right? It's like, I'm single, I'm ready to mingle, but everybody else is in a relationship, all right? Annoying, okay? So I'm ready to react, but now that guy's taken, that guy's taken, that guy's taken, that guy's taken, okay? So as I proceed with my reaction, there is less and less availability for any particular moiety to react with any other moiety. And so, the rate at which my reaction proceeds is dependent on the current degree of cure of the piece. Okay, so this is the important one. It will depend on time and temperature, but also on current degree of cure. Okay, that makes this a complicated differential equation because if my rate is dependent on the current value, that's differential equation. So the way that people handle this and the way that people model this is they'll say that the degree of cure, the rate of change of the degree of cure as a function of time, which is sort of what we've written here, is equal to some constant or some value k, which uh, sort of encompasses all of the time temperature aspects, right? So k, which is usually a function of temperature and time and also multiplied by some function of alpha, all right, where this is some function that describes the rate history of the reaction. So this takes care of degree of cure. And this takes care of time temperature dependence. All right. So some function k, which is a function of time and temperature, multiplied by some function of alpha, which is the degree of cure history, right? which is something that we'll need. Okay, so where? I don't want red. Hey. Alpha dot t is what we call the rate of reaction. So it's how fast my degree of cure is changing. This function here, F alpha, is a function which describes like the history or the shape of the degree of cure. And then finally, this K, which is a function usually of time and temperature, is what's known as the rate constant. All right. So if I know that my rate of reaction here is dependent on the history of the degree of cure, I can plot those two things against each other and take a look at what that graph might look like. That'll give me hints as to what my variable k will need to be. So look at alpha uh, versus alpha dot curve. So I'll bring that up here, and we'll talk our way through it. All right. Here's an example for the resin system I just had previously shown. So this was for same epoxy plus vinyl ester system from before. OK, so lots of lines in this guy. Again, different lines for different curing temperatures. Again, here are my curing temperatures, 65, 60, 50, so on and so forth. Now let's take a look at what happens and let's sort of interpret what's going on in this figure. All right, so the degree of cure is here on the bottom. So that is how far along my reaction has proceeded. 
once I get to a hundred percent degree of cure, then my reaction can no longer proceed. So at a hundred percent degree of cure, which is here, we would expect the value to be zero. It has to be zero because there's no way that my reaction can proceed at all if there are no more sites left to react. Okay, so we would expect that this data would converge to zero once the degree of cure alpha is one. All right, and we sort of see that happening here with all of these particular curves. It looks like they're sort of trying to approach that zero value when the degree of cure is one. Now let's talk about some of the other interesting aspects or interesting points that we might understand physically. All right, what happens when we first mix this thing, meaning that the degree of cure is zero? Well, like I said, all of the sites around me are available for bonding. Everybody's single, everybody's ready to mingle, okay? So what that means is that I can react here or here or here, meaning that the rate that the reaction will proceed will initially be pretty fast and will be growing quickly. That's because I'm reacting over here and providing additional heat to my reaction. Okay, so this generally has like a positively upward slope initially. All right, many sites to react. And more importantly, it's generating heat. Okay, that's because as I'm reacting and as my components are reacting with the things around it, it's an exothermic reaction. So I'm generating heat, which will cause the reaction to go faster. All right, so you see the increase in the rate of the degree of cure increasing initially as I'm curing my composite. Interesting. Okay, now we reach some plateau up here. So this is a point where we've reached the maximum rate of reaction for this particular piece. It's sort of like this equilibrium between, yeah, there's some sites available to me and my exothermic reaction has provided enough temperature where I'm really like hopped up. And so my reaction rate is very fast because I have many sites available and I'm generally hot, right? So uh, let's draw this in blue so we don't kind of confuse this. Uh, max rate, and that's because resin is warm and still many sites. All right, then kind of the party's over, the party is ending. Everybody's finding their mate. They're going home at the end of the night. Things are dying down. So on the back end here, we start to see this reduction in the rate of the reaction because, all right, there's not a lot of sites left. Uh, I'm losing that exothermic energy that I had, and so my rate's really going to start to decrease. And lastly here now, slowing rate, uh, and that's because losing reaction sites and cooling temperature. All right, so a lot to unpack with that particular figure, but hopefully we kind of followed what's going along with that particular uh, idea. And you see here that, yeah, the temperature has a massive effect on how these curves are going. So low temperature cures, like the part doesn't last very long. Uh, it's like a lame party without any beer or something. All right. So it doesn't last very long. People go home early. They don't like that party. All right. That's the general idea. So what do these uh, functions actually look like? So we know that we're governed by The general form is something like alpha dot t is this rate constant k, which is a function of temperature and time, multiplied by some function of alpha. So what is this function of alpha? All right, well, these are sort of empirical models now based on experiment. So empirical, meaning they're based on experiment.
the first that you would learn about is the simple nth order rate equation. And you might have even learned about this in your chemistry class. So most simplistic for these models is the nth order rate equation. All right, that nth order rate equation looks something like this. That is alpha dot as a function of t is this k, which will be empirical from experiment as a function of temperature and time, remember, multiplied by this general form, one minus alpha to the n. That's your nth order rate equation. This reaction rate K, as with most chemical reactions, is governed by the Arrhenius, uh, Arrhenius equation. So this is the rate constant. And usually governed by got to make sure I spell this right. Um, A R R. H E N I U S. Did I get that right? Yes. Spelling for the win. Uh, so almost always this K is going to be something like A E to the negative delta E on R T. I hope that you have seen this before. If you haven't, I don't know what they're doing in your chemistry class. All right. This is the general Arrhenius reaction rate uh, for most chemical reactions. All right. In this particular equation, A is it's called the frequency factor. Delta E is the activation energy. different for each particular resin. R is the universal gas constant. And here T obviously is temperature. Important here that you're working in Kelvin. All right. So remember Kelvin is different from centigrade by a value of 273. All right, so make sure you know that. All right, so this is the K that feeds in here. And uh, we need to define some of these other guys. All right, so let's talk about what each one of those are. Obviously, alpha is degree of cure. And then N here is a rate constant. And for most systems, N is approximately 2. For whatever reason, that's what it generally is. All right? So this uh, sort of rate constant, it's governing the order of decay. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at what this general model looks like. All right, so we're going to plot this model here for various values of k. So more or less, we're plotting the shape of this. Here we'll let n equal 1. So this model looks something like this. And remember, we're trying to match the data that looks like this.
Okay. So, I don't know. It's a little suspicious. Here we see these various values of k, which I discussed before. That is here in this particular equation. So we're just taking k as some constant value and looking how the shape of this particular function changes. So we're plotting the change in the rate as a function of the value alpha. So again, here's d alpha dt, and here is the degree of cure alpha. You see again, all these systems converging to zero as my degree of cure approaches one. And that's again, because there's no sites left to react when, I've, when I'm fully cure. So we're trying to model this behavior with this function. How do we think we did? Uh, yikes, not the best fit there, okay? So it tries, but not the best, all right? So not the best model. Does not capture. Effects well at alpha approximately equal to zero. So we know at alpha equals zero, we start out at some baseline value and then we increase. Okay. We don't see this with the nth order reaction model. All right. It starts high and it comes low. It doesn't have this initial increase, which we saw in actual data. All right, so it's it's good, but not great. It does kind of capture this like tailing off effect, which is like kind of here, but eh, not the best. All right. So it assumes that the reaction is very quick to start, meaning that as soon as I mix these things together, everyone just goes crazy. All right. And then it just chills out and mellows out over time. It's really not accounting for like that exothermic form of the reaction where it's providing heat, providing heat, and then giving additional excitement to the reaction, which is like the thing that we sort of see here, right? Instead, the model just kind of like assumes like this sort of behavior, right? Which, you know, not, not, not so great, okay? All right, so that's the nth order rate equation. We need a better need a better equation. All right, the more general, and I'll say better equation is what's known as the general rate equation. That form is the following. Alpha dot as a function of t here. Now we're going to have multiple rate constants and multiple uh, orders to our reaction. This is the most commonly accepted model. K1 plus K2 alpha to the m multiplied by 1 minus alpha to the n, not n. Most commonly used and accepted. All right. This model will better capture the things that are happening on the front end of your reaction. All right. So let's define some of these. K1 and K2 are reaction rate constants. depend on temperature. Obviously, they're like Arrhenius with temperature. We have M and N, our order constants. Okay, usually added together equal to two. Right. 
all of this information from experiment. So you need to run experiments. You need to understand how the heat generates over time to give yourself the degree of cure as a function of time, then start fitting these parameters to that data. All right. Here are some various values that you might anticipate. So, for instance, at a temperature of 45 degrees, here's K1, here's K2, here's M, here's N. You see that M plus N is equal to 2 in this situation. All right, at a higher temperature, we have different values of K1, K2, M, and N for the same exact resin system. Right? These are different resin types, so on and so forth. And so you, you get a general idea of that people have investigated these epoxies over time and have come up with these models for how their rate of reaction proceeds. So can I anticipate how long it's going to take for me to complete the reaction? Can I anticipate what the degree of cure will be at any particular time t? Well, yes. And that's because I've done a lot of experiments to understand what the constants are that feed into this general rate equation. OK. So that'll be it for today. On Friday, we'll do an example where we sort of look at how this degree of cure evolves, and then we'll talk about uh, viscosity impl implicate implementations, impl implications, implications, implications. That's the word, viscosity implications. Because as we progress with our degree of cure, our viscosity is going to change. Initially, when we're heating it up, the viscosity decreases because there's added temperature, but over time, it really shoots up to infinity because we're creating a solid. So we have to anticipate about how long that's going to take. All right. That's it for today. Thanks for coming. Uh, see you on Friday.